The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right. So hello, everybody. Welcome to our webinar. We're really excited to welcome participants from really all over the place to this webinar on what we think is such an important and timely topic. What is the role of the adult in youth-led action? So we're going to go ahead and get started. So for those of you um, who've attended before, you know that we ask just a couple of uh, quick questions after our survey, and tonight is no different. So please take just a couple minutes after our survey is over and answer those questions. It really helps us a lot in a lot of different ways. So um, a little box will pop up and you just answer a few quick questions. It'll definitely take you less than five minutes, probably closer to two or three. All right, let's get started. So my name is Christina Holvershorn, and I'm the program manager for HEART in Indianapolis, Indiana. Much of my career has been as an educator in public schools, both in elementary and high school settings. And I also started a nonprofit in Chicago that focuses on youth-led action. So I continue to work on a number of youth-led projects, and most of them are focused around environmental issues and are driven by youth-led action. But before all of that, I was a youth activist myself. And all of these experiences have given me a lot of ideas and opinions on the matter. So I'm constantly learning, and I hope to share some of what I've learned with you this evening. So I also wanted to mention that another member of the HEART team is with us tonight. Her name's Kim Corona. And so you might hear her pop in and out to help us with any technical issues or questions if they arise. And I wanted to take, um, we I think it's an opportunity, we have a relatively small group with us tonight, and I wanted to take just a minute, um, if anybody is comfortable, um, sharing either in the question box or the chat box. So if you look at your panel, um, look for either a question bar or a chat bar. And I'm really interested in knowing what kind of youth-led action are you interested in? Uh, maybe you already are doing some certain kind of work, but let's take just a second, and um, if you're able to pop over to the question or the chat bar and type in anything that you're particularly interested in or something that you're actually working on. That helps me um, be a little bit more responsive to the actual interests of, of the group that we have here tonight. So we'll take just a second to see if anybody um, is adding what kind of action, youth-led action, are you, are you most interested in? All right, we have a, a really interesting one. So somebody is um, with us tonight and is trying to develop a group for at-risk girls in the community. That's excellent. Um, and I think we can um, definitely, definitely have some, some specifics that we could support you with on that one. If there's anybody else that has any specific ideas or needs. Hey Kim, I see a hand up. I'm not sure. Yes, I was just going to mention that. So I'm not sure if that means that, um, that person is having trouble typing in their question box. Um, so uh, um, if, that's, if that's the issue, unfortunately I'm not quite sure how to resolve it. Um, you might have your panel closed. So um, just look if you can see like a little orange arrow that you can click on and it should open up your, your toolbar where you can have your question box and your chat box to type in. All right. Um, also feel free to use this question box throughout the evening. If something comes up or, or you have something that you want to um, have addressed, please don't hesitate to, to point it out. And Kim may be the one to um, direct my attention towards that, but um, we hope, you know, as much as we can to make this a, a two-way dialogue tonight. So if anybody else, oh, I saw another one come in, I think. 
Um, oh, perfect, youth and climate change. So that's my specialty. So you're gonna get to hear a lot about that. So um, that's a perfect fit for, for some of what I'm doing and um, I think you'll get a lot. All right, so we're gonna keep on going and I'm really excited to have everybody with me here tonight. This is, I think, such a, a relevant um, and important topic. So it's wise to start with the definition, right? So let's start by trying to define youth-led action, but I'm not gonna make it that simple. We're gonna start by um, defining it through some examples. So let's start with some of the most timely examples of youth-led action. I'd be remiss to not mention these folks. So the survivors and activists who emerged from the Parkland school shooting tragedy, they've captured the attention of our entire nation. So they're modeling public speaking, protesting, organizing, storytelling, they're kind of doing it all. And then of course they're also organizing a national march in Washington. So suddenly these youth are at the heart of the debate on gun legislation in the US. And I like this example of how powerful youth-led action can really be. So they're so sincere and they're so compelling. And for that reason, youth-led youth action can be one of the most impactful ways of creating change. In a culture where we often don't listen fully to youth, youth-led action ironically surpasses adult-led action because it forces the rest of us to really stop, take notice, and think about why youth take this issue so seriously. It's so much harder to discount youth than other grown people. Just this morning, I heard um, the, these activists compared to um, the youth activists that really uh, mobilized around Vietnam. So there's some really interesting comparisons being made because these folks are so potent. So we'll keep going. And some of you may have seen this uh, this book. This is a book about Audrey Faye Hendricks. And she was a youth civil rights activist. And she was part of a youth-led segment of action where youth were arrested for marching for civil rights and jailed. And it was a strategic way to force the issue of segregation to the forefront of her community. So she was just nine years old and she was the one who convinced her parents that she wanted to be part of this action. Now I like Audrey's example as well because it shows us how youth action can be part of a broader movement and doesn't always need to be out on its own. So this example could be a little bit confusing, I acknowledge, because it was part of that adult led movement, but what distinguishes it here is that youth had a voice and the option to participate. So I use it because it, it inspires creativity in youth and is particularly empowering for kids to see stories of others who took action which led to positive results. So it's really important for us not to think of youth-led activism as using children as puppets or props in adult-led initiatives. For example, I'll use myself as an example here. I remember being asked uh, to speak at a school board meeting when I was in the fifth grade. And even though I created my own speech, I wasn't at the table discussing strategy. In fact, I can't even remember what I was speaking about now. So clearly I was not really motivated to address a bigger goal. Um, so that was an example of someone using me a little bit more as a prop than as a you know central decision maker. Now, I'm not saying it was a terrible thing to involve me. That was actually probably really good for, for my development, my self-esteem. Um, and it's not a bad thing to use youth voice to speak out, but I would not say that was an example of a youth-led action. So hopefully we're getting a little bit closer to a definition of what is and isn't youth-led action. So we'll keep going. So we've had some large scale examples, but let's consider one that might be a little bit closer to home. Has anybody here ever been around a child who learns how important conserving energy is? So some launch into their own campaigns to ensure everyone in the family or the school is adhering to a lights off when not in the room kind of policy. So this might seem like something else entirely, but it's not. This is youth led action. These examples that may seem a little bit more tangible and familiar are important for us to nurture and to support. Kids who learn that they have this power are so much more likely to continue to take the lead. So as you can see, our definition is pretty broad, but we consider youth-led action to be any positive action youth take on their own accord, based on their own ideas, in order to help make our world a better place. So this includes small-scale initiatives at home and school, as well as broader initiatives where they're working to actually mobilize others. So some are clearly activism, and others are simple acts that are designed to impact issues of concern. So especially for our younger youth, those tangible actions are really important. 
they need small wins to see how potent they really are. So um, an example could be a young child who can sway their family's eating habits for the better or who convinces their parents to only buy clothes that weren't made in sweatshops. So I want you to take a minute and think about a time when you've witnessed youth take positive youth-led action. So take a second, see if you've ever witnessed that yourself. And then I also want you to think of some times when you've seen or tried to get, in, get youth involved, but when it wasn't actually through youth-led examples. So we're kind of thinking of times when it's worked well and times when maybe it hasn't worked quite so well. And I think that these are really useful for us to think about now because it'll be easier to understand when you're employing some of the strategies that we're recommending, as well as learning ways that you can improve next time around. So if you're anything like me, you're constantly evaluating and recalibrating how you're working with youth. So hopefully some of these strategies will be really useful in some of your next endeavors. So if you're new to our work, um, we just want to take a minute to reflect on what this has to do with heart and humane education. So our mission as a humane education organization is to develop a generation of compassionate youth who create positive change for animals, people, and the natural world. Traditional education stops short of defining what comes next after the education becomes rooted in the brains of students. And humane education defines our work as successful when we see that that information is driving positive action. It isn't enough from our perspective for students to just learn the issues. We want to develop impassioned, critical thinkers who know how to impact change, both big and small. So it's time to get into it. How can we as teachers, organizers, parents, and any other kind of interested adult nurture these amazing youth? So if we simply teach about the most challenging issues of our times and leave students feeling powerless and hopeless, we've left out the most important step. So giving students alternatives and pathways to impacting these situations is important for the issues themselves, but also for the well-being of the students. Powerlessness is a terrible feeling and one that we have to work hard not to impart. So I wanted to start with this quote that, that I really like, that action is the antidote to despair. So there's a lot of ways to think about this. But as I thought back to all of my successes and failures, and there's many, uh, working with youth around particular issues, I realized that it all came down to the right balance of these factors. So I made this, this model up. It begins with knowledge. So we start here in the, with the blue. And I would argue that knowledge needs to be compelling enough to engage then their passion and motivation. So we're calling that compelling education. In any case, they need to understand the topics we address. So let's use, for example, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So this is the floating island of human-generated garbage in the Pacific Ocean. It's bigger than two Texases, or, or two Texai. Um, so, and I actually just read an article that said that it's growing exponentially and it might be much, much larger than previously thought. So it might be even bigger than that. So kids are fascinated by this. And in order to take meaningful action, obviously they would need to understand geography so where is it? What kind of trash is part of it? Is it mostly fishing nets? Is it garbage coming from different islands? Is it coming from landfills? What, where, where does it come from? Um, impact on animals, humans, and ecosystems, the sources of that trash. So all those things are really important. I couldn't just march into a classroom and say, we are going to stop the Great Pacific Garbage Patch and have kids really want to care or participate. If, however, they really understand the issue, they would be far more likely to stand up and cheer and be right there with me if and, and have useful and realistic ideas on how they can impact that change. So we have tons more information on our website about how to create compelling education opportunities through humane education, but today's focus is what happens after that seed has been planted and after that spark has been lit. But I do really recommend, and we're going to give you this link at the end, um, but we just put up a, a wonderful library on our website. So our website is teachhumane.org and then slash library. There's tons of great resources. We have comprehensive resource guides. We have, um, we have all sorts of things on our webpage um, that really fits the bill for a definition of compelling education because I think we've done a lot of that work and, and, and really want people to benefit from that and jump right into to that, um, those educational opportunities we've created. All right, so back to our, our diagram. So we have knowledge, but this isn't enough. So as we know, 
Only those students who become passionate and motivated are the ones who take action. So there's a lot of reasons for this. Some are innate, some are out of our control, but I think kids are naturally passionate and motivated. We just have to set up the right environments and expectations to bring it out of them. Modeling passion and care is one of the best ways I've seen to bring this out in kids. Being the one adult who really cares deeply about community and world issues may be all kids need to uncover that passion in themselves. Another really important thing here is demonstrating precedent for youth action. So showing them that they can make meaningful action and keeping them tuned into the issue because it's competing with the multitude of other things kids have on their minds like school, social lives, sports, extracurriculars, etc. So showing them role models of youth who've made powerful change is a really, really important aspect of this work. If you can't imagine yourself doing something meaningful, it's hard to want to put the time or energy into doing that. So also, um, I want to emphasize that kids need to have room to develop their own passions. So I might think that every kid needs to care about issues, for example, affecting endangered species. But then I'd be neglecting a multitude of other issues kids truly care about. All kids care deeply about something. So try not to take it personally when the issues they care about are different than the ones that you care about or the ones that you want them to care about. This is often an opportunity to dive deeper into root causes and intersectionality because the root cause of many issues troubling our planet and all of its inhabitants are often intertwined. So it's wonderful to have diversity of ideas and passions and be responsive and supportive of our youth as they uncover those topics that really speak to them. So what should their action be? This entire model presupposes that that decision just isn't up to us. It's up to the leaders, the youth. We can and should play a part in that, but we really have to be careful not to define that action for youth. Where there's no room for creativity, we'll find a room with no youth. And I, I say that sort of as a joke, but um, I can't tell you the number of times when I've defined what a project should be. And if it's not compelling for kids, they're not gonna show up. So let's focus on that last element and really define what skills, resources, and support actually mean. So one of the best ways to support youth is by being there to help them develop the many skills that they need to do this work. It's amazing how quickly we forget all of the skills that we've learned since childhood. So part of my professional life is that I'm the director for restorative practices at a nonprofit in Indianapolis called Peace Learning Center. So I lead a lot of professional developments and help schools sort of at the ground level with restorative circles when problem behaviors emerge. So particularly, I work with expellable offenses. So these are kids who have been put up for um, expulsion for one reason or another. And at the heart of almost all of these circles, what we uncover is a missing skill. So perhaps a student had poor coping strategies for disappointment. So she flipped a desk or harmed another student because something disappointed her. Perhaps another didn't have functional communication strategies, so relied only on his fists. You can see where I'm going here. Behavior is only a small part of the story. The more interesting part is the skill, because that's what gives us the opportunity to actually help that student address the behavior in a way that's meaningful. So imagine you're working with a group of students who, for example, want to change the purchasing decisions for their school district. If students have a hard time writing, communicating, working in a group, et cetera, the entire project is just gonna be a hot mess. So if instead we see which students enjoy research and support them with that, we see which students are comfortable in front of a crowd and enhance those skills, we're much more likely to achieve those goals. So in just a couple minutes, I'm gonna share some case studies of the times when we got this balance just right. And so that, that particular example is a foreshadowing of, of a time when the group of kids we were working with just nailed it in terms of actually changing the purchasing uh, decisions for their, their whole school district. So we'll keep going here. Um, working with and listening to one another is just a skill that we need to teach. So breaking it down and giving each person a role, talking through concerns, et cetera, those are one of the best ways that we can be of service to youth. We can't assume that kids have even the most basic skills because we may be setting them up for failure. Now I don't say that to say that, don't assume that they're not brilliant, but often skills are what get in the way. So often they surpass you and they're gonna have skills that, that surpass yours in many areas, but it's wise to start from a place of support to scaffold them in order to refine skills. So another important skill is gonna be how to communicate with adults. 
Now, this is a really challenging one for a number of kids because our entire education system is predicated on one skill, I would argue, which is to listen to and comply with adults. If a child does not know how to listen to and comply with adults, they're going to have a really hard time in almost every school. Now think of how tremendous of a pivot we're asking of them when we encourage them to stand up to adult decision makers and stakeholders. So some kids are naturally able to do this, but others might need some work. So it may seem intimidating, um, but addressing this with kids and listening to the reservations they may have is really, really important. Also, having that talk that saying something that you think adults might not want to hear, that doesn't make you bad or mean. That makes you brave and strong. That's something um, that a lot of kids need some coaching on. So let's talk about strategizing. So this can be something that is a whole new ball game for kids. So start talking about those power structures, stakeholders, consumer power, education campaigns, the legislative process. All of that is brand new to many kids. They can get it really quickly though, but it's often something that they haven't learned. So make room for teaching um, some of those strategies and some of those frameworks so that they can understand them and then leave room for their creative and clever ways of addressing the problem. So the next is a catch-all category, but create opportunities to give students the ability to refine those skills that they're going to need. Let them determine how they'd like to use those skills, but giving them connections to experts and skill building opportunities in specific areas will really pay off. So a couple of tips here. If I ask an introverted artist to speak in front of our city county council, he may never come back to work with me again. But if I find a way for him to contribute meaningfully, that's also a fit for his skills and comfort level, he will be in. So I'm going to give you some more examples of this a little bit later on. We've had some introverted kids, some artists that didn't quite find their groove until we found a way for them to meaningfully co contribute um, with given their skill sets. So when a kid doesn't get it, break that skill down further. There are so many parts we expect for the mastery of a skill, and often there's some fundamental thing missing. So for example, communication is a problem. It's easy to, sh to shut it down and say, well, I can't get these kids to communicate with me. Um, but let's say, um, let's say we have to communicate using a Facebook group, and the kids just aren't getting on there to check it regularly or something like that. What's missing there is the skill of knowing when to check and the, the um, reminder system of you know, checking that group account four times a week. And then further, that skill of how to give themselves that reminder. So is that creating an electronic reminder using whatever device they have? Is it making sure that they have some sort of calendar? So literally helping them break down all of these little skills. Um, they, these things can get in the way, but they're surmountable when we break them down. Now, last but not least, um, make sure that you own it when you make mistakes. So apologize if you've made a mistake and create a tone that we will learn when something doesn't go well, but we're not going to dwell on it or shame ourselves. We want kids to be bold and creative, and that's going to be harder to do when they're really worried about having to be perfect. So acknowledge mistakes and then keep moving forward with a clean slate. When we model that, kids are going to be much, much more likely um, to be willing to do the same. So a lot of these actions are part of a much larger struggle, and they're not going to be easy. So disappointment and frustration with others for not listening or caring is something we all have to manage. So you just have to address this. You have to model that skill of getting back up and trying again. So showing them that it's okay to learn from these mistakes or letdowns and showing them how to not take them personally will really help them go far and will help them stay tuned in and stay working on these important issues. So let's take a quick look back at our diagram. So notice that element on the outside that hovers around each gear. That's relationships. So relationships really are the glue that hold this entire structure together. So I'm going to give you guys an opportunity to type something else again, get, get engaged again. I want you to take a moment and um, in that question box, um, I want you to, to add anything that you feel compelled to add. So I want you to think of a time that you wanted to be in a project, a cause, something in your professional career, or anything that involved working in a group. Now, think about 
whether or not negative relationships have ever come into play. So the question is, in what ways, in just a few words, have relationships repelled you from being part of something? So hopefully we have plenty of positive examples when relationships were, were in good shape, but I want you to, just for this, this exercise, think about the ways when relationships, when they're not healthy and functional, can repel people from causes and projects. So take a quick minute and type in that question box, what does that look like? What does it look like when relationships are not intact and you're sort of repelled from working with a particular group? Now, as some of you are typing, I can see, um, I'll, I'll share an example of my own. I've worked with a lot of groups, um, and, and sometimes when there's a group that's particularly um, male-dominated, and I can't say this has happened recently, but this used to happen a lot, um, maybe 10 years ago, it was really hard for me to even get a word in. It was really hard for me to even say, say you know, any of the ideas that I had. And so there have been a lot of groups that I did not um, stay part of because I felt like my voice just didn't matter. So it's an example of, of one. And if anybody, so whether or not they're being typed, I just want you to think about that for a second. Um, uh, yeah, there's one that came in. Okay. Um, so someone was involved in a group where two of the people in the group were disagreeing in really unhealthy ways and um so several people left the group as a result of it yeah i love that example because often the challenging situations might not even involve us um but because that they're they're so challenging and sometimes so toxic we just pushed away so i think that's a perfect encapsulation of, of what it is i'm talking about here um, the relationships at any point in this model, if they're out of line or not intact, um, everything can kind of fall apart. So I couldn't resist asking this question, um, and, and I think we all unfortunately probably have lots of examples of this, um, but I couldn't resist asking because I really want to drill home how important relationships are. So everything can be derailed like i said when when they're not in balance so these relationships that i'm talking about they could be youth to youth relationships they could be adult to youth they could be adult to parent they could be any combination of these relationships but if you're lucky enough to be the adult who's involved in any part of youth-led action whether it's the learning the engaging or the action itself and you aren't maintaining a positive relationship with these youth things won't work out as well as they should. So this doesn't mean that you should be a pushover or exclusively a, a friend, that's in air quotes. Um, it means that your relationship is strong enough to weather a challenge, a conflict, or a major disappointment. So my best tips for that really are contained in the first section of our comprehensive resource guide. Um, so I specialize in social emotional learning and um, we put our, our very, the greatest hits of, of uh, building healthy, positive, youth-led um, groups and, and those relationships are in that first section of our comprehensive resource guide. So um, we'll, we'll put those um, links in here as well. So you can, Kim, are those links? Um, I saw one of them. I just want to make sure I'm directing people to the right place. Yeah, so I typed in teachheart.org slash library that everybody can copy and paste in the chat box. Um, and that should bring people to all the resources, all her resources. Perfect. Yep, there, that's at that library. And the particular ones that I'm talking about in the comprehensive guide are in the very first section. Um, so that's a free free uh, download on the website. And they're basically group strategies for bonding, creating your own norms, and talking through disagreements. Sometimes these things sound so simple that you think you don't really need them. Um, and I would say always, always, always err on the side of putting as much time and energy in building those relationships as you can. So one thing that I'd be remiss not to address is how to keep kids connected. It can be the hardest thing just to get kids to show up. So my best advice here 
is persistence and use whatever method of communication they tell you they will use. I cannot get kids to check email as much as I wish they would, but I can use the apps that they've told me to use. Um, and then for younger students, texting and reminding their parents is often essential. People are so busy, and this work is often on top of so many other things that they're juggling. But be persistent, maintain that positive relationship, and they're gonna be so much more likely to show up and work hard. And the relationship piece is so important in this instance of youth not following through. So for example, if I have a kid who um, was supposed to come to an event or a meeting and, and doesn't come, if I have a, a healthy relationship with that child, um, or teen, and I, an honest sentence like, I'm really disappointed that you didn't come to the meeting. I was relying on you to speak. What's going on? That's going to start a conversation. So I don't need to be the judge and jury. I need to meet that person where they are and try to figure out and problem solve so that hopefully they can come the next time. So you can imagine that that's going to be a much, much better conversation if that relationship is a strong one. And if it's not, you know, think about what that child will probably do. They're probably going to distance themselves from me and the, the entire project. So keep going here. So if one kind of support is providing skills, another kind is by providing kids with resources. So I'm not going to pretend like this is going to be an all-inclusive list because each project is going to demand very specific kinds of resources, but these are a few of the recurring needs that I've observed. So we have to create realistic blocks of time. Kids work in different ways than adults, and some would say that they're less efficient. I'd say on a good day that they're busy doing the important work of reaching their social emotional developmental milestones, <laughs> but we have to give realistic amounts of time to get anything substantial done. So don't neglect to create time to role play, practice, debrief, and deal with conflict. Those are often the most important, but the most neglected elements that I've observed. Now I'm all for getting a lot done, so I'm happy to have high expectations for productivity, um, and kids are a lot more likely to respect those boundaries if they know that they're gonna get some social time to enjoy each other and laugh. So also build that in. Tell them that they can relax and joke when whatever you're working on is complete. Otherwise, they're gonna be constantly trying to fit that in and it can compete with your productivity. So that might look like every hour they get a five minute break to hang out or, or maybe every 45 minutes you're gonna play a 15 minute game, something like that. But, but build that stuff in so that they know they can also access some, some social time. So in the, in the camp I help run, this is a climate camp um, that we run in Indianapolis, Indiana, we put a lot of time and energy into building healthy, cohesive groups. So I use techniques from an organization called Tribes, which is a wonderful social emotional learning curricula. And I use that to help kids connect with one another. Um, and we also ask them to create their own agreements for peace. So they're coming up with their own ground rules. Um, and then they only need to stick to the rules that they've created for themselves. It sounds like such a simple process, but it changes everything. Um, and it changes the, the way, the kind of conversations that I have with groups when we've really invested the time in allowing everybody to have a say over the general principles that are gonna be guiding us. So let's talk about fun. So I tend to be kind of the let's get things done kind of person, but luckily my counterpart in climate camp, his name is Jim Poyser, and he runs an organization called Earth Charter Indiana and Youth Power Indiana. He knows how to not take things too seriously. So we kind of balance each other out and he can enjoy some spontaneous moments of fun. So I'm gonna tell you a story about a time we were downtown and it was time to ask the students to practice their speeches. So we were in an outdoor theater area. They had been rehearsing these speeches and you know, our schedule dictated it was time to practice these speeches. So of course it starts to rain. And what do the kids do? It was a really hot day. They run right out into the rain and they're stomping in puddles and they started this spontaneous game where every kid was involved in their, I, I can't remember what game it was, but it was this really wild and fun, spontaneous group game. So the teacher and the mom in me was worried that they'd get too wet or too messy. And I, I, there was a part of me that felt like, oh, they're wasting time. I wanted to gather them up, get them under the shelter and get to work. Um, but luckily my colleague, Jim, knew that fun is a basic need for kids, especially in a summer camp. So we laughed along, let them play, and we even joined in for a little bit. Soon enough, they were tired. They were ready to come back and get some work done. 
but those are the parts of camp that kids remember. So kids won't say, oh yeah, that group is really efficient and streamlined, but they will say what groups are or aren't fun. So finding meaningful ways to enjoy your time together in ways that kids enjoy, not necessarily in the ways that you enjoy, um, is a really, really important thing. Because remember, a lot of this work is voluntary. A lot of this work relies on kids wanting to come and wanting to participate. So we really can't neglect those, those opportunities for fun. So another thing oh, that I like, yes. I don't mean to interrupt, but I just want to let you know, right after you mentioned tribes, um, I put in the link if people want to learn more about it. And there was actually someone uh, who asked specifically where they could learn where. So I just wanted to bring to attention if anyone else is interested that information you can have easily. Perfect. Yeah, so Tribes has trainings that they can do for entire organizations, but they also sell their resources online, um, and it's totally worth it. You get a book that has um, pretty much every kind of team building activity that you, you would need, but they also show you how to make sure that the group and the community is a healthy functioning unit. And, and as we know, in this world, that's super, super important. So thank you for doing that, Kim. Um, so one of the parts of tribes, actually, that's a perfect segue, um, we orient them into these small groups called tribes. So that's why it's named that. They actually get to work in these small groups. Um, so every student, from the moment they become part of, of this work that we're doing, they're part of a tribe. Um, and there's a, a long process. They actually get to kind of, um, through mutual interests and skills and whatnot, they orient themselves into tribes. So we use youth counselors also to make sure that every student feels like they belong. Um, and our youth counselors are given the clear directive that nobody is gonna be left out. So that's just an expectation that we, we aim the bar high. Nobody's gonna be left out. We're gonna find ways to make sure everybody is part of, of this work. So another critical piece is the removal of obstacles. So you can imagine if there's a cranky staff person complaining about your project, it's usually an adult job. Um, I say that, but I've seen some kids manage cranky adults in ways better than, than I possibly could. Um, <laughs> the bus is late and the group can't be there on time. Great time for you as the adult to step in. So there's always gonna be obstacles, but we're often the best suited to help with them. Now, of course, let them in on this if there's um, the opportunity for them to be part of things or to learn from how to get those obstacles out of the way, absolutely. But many of the obstacles that we deal with are constructs of people who are resisting this work. So seeing this modeled is gonna serve them well, but um, it's, it's one of those things that as an adult, I tend to try to absorb some of those obstacles. Transportation, that's a big one. So in Indianapolis, we've come up with a partnership with our local public transit so that we often have bus cards to share. Um, but setting up parent carpools, deciding on meeting points close to youth, those things are really important. And if kids aren't coming, trans, uh, troubleshoot that transportation piece. If we aren't careful with this one, we leave kids out who don't have the privilege of transportation and miss out on the brilliance and contributions of a lot of amazing kids. So come up with ways um, to troubleshoot transportation if at all possible. And be bold, ask other organizations if you can borrow their, um, their minibus, if they have a driver even, often people are willing to volunteer. We found a lot of generosity in the community if we're just open and honest about that need. There's a lot of boys and girls clubs, churches, other kinds of organizations that have vans and minibuses and, and they're already carrying insurance and they're, you know, so make sure that you get all of those um, T's crossed and I's dotted, but um, often you can troubleshoot transportation just by asking someone else who has access to it. All right, so it might sound like everything's fun and games, we're playing in the rain, <laughs> um, but kids also need to know what their boundaries are gonna be. So aside from the very specific agreements that we ask groups to make, sometimes they need really specific boundaries. So something along the lines of, okay guys, we need to finish this letter to the governor by 3.30, let's focus, or we have to stay in groups as we walk downtown to be safe, et cetera. Those are examples of some of the, the easier boundaries to set. But kids need and they appreciate boundaries. And I know that this can kind of feel like a strange thing because your kids are there voluntarily, you're doing something that should feel fun. Um, that doesn't mean that kids don't need and appreciate to have safety and boundaries. I also often use something called an effective statement and actually gave an example of, of that before as well. So 
for example, so an effective statement is very similar to an I message. The idea is that I'm I'm trying to explain to that child how their actions are affecting me or how they're affecting the community. So it's affect with an A. So for example, if I've got a bunch of um, side conversations, I could say something along the lines of, I'm really confused by the amount of chit chat because we only have an hour together and you guys aren't using that time very well. Am I missing something? So that's me inviting a conversation and also insisting on a boundary that we're gonna get done whatever we need to get done. So the next one, technology, supplies, logistics, that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, handling a, a bus schedule, bringing the poster board, those are all things we can do. So often when I see a gap in those things like technology, supplies, logistics, I try to jump in to help. Um, I don't do that if I know that the kids already have it, but sometimes those are the, the places that things can kind of just get derailed. So um, often kids are gonna jump in and help with them, but it's not wise to assume that all groups can or will. Now, stakeholders, what am I talking about there? Um, it's really important that kids have access to stakeholders. And this is gonna vary for every, di you know, every different kind of project. So sometimes that's going to be our role to be involved with the 50 emails to get the kids in the meeting with their council person or the 30 phone calls that it takes to get them an interview with that local paper. But if you know you have kids who have a message that needs to be heard, do that behind the scenes work so that you can get them the audience. That doesn't mean that there couldn't be certain kids helping with that effort, but sometimes um, doing everything possible to get them access to those stakeholders can be some of the most important work that you do. So we're going to talk a little bit more about handling other adults later in the webinar, but I do want to bring up a couple of points. The adult world is a privileged one, and often gatekeepers won't, for example, rent out a space to a 10-year-old. Um, so handling things like meeting spaces, emailing invites, that can be a useful job for adults. I've had many a meeting with adults who didn't want to implement a youth-led idea or who thought it was a waste of time. In this regard, if you're able to kind of run interference, especially on behalf of young change makers, it can be helpful. So the way that we speak about these youth also help pave the way for them to be taken seriously. So encourage adults to take them and their message seriously. Even if it's just a conversation that requires some bravery on your part, they deserve to be seen as legitimate and often your work helps set the tone for the way that others will receive them and connecting with those experts. So this is another one. I've been amazed at how generous people are with their time. So consider others already working in your arena. So likely they're people who would be delighted to connect with kids interested in their subject. People are often very generous with their time, whether to offer a Q&A, lecture, skill sharing session. There's a lot of nonprofits already doing this work and many of them are, are really eager to access kids. So when you were, um, I was thinking about, a group for young ladies. There's tons of um, groups that are really interested in teaching, um, you know, how to avoid dating violence, how to be safe in, you know, all of these different things that people are trying to do and they're, they're just trying to access kids. So don't be afraid to reach out to nonprofits, other activist groups and ask, would you be willing to come meet with my group or would you be willing to do, um, you know, Q&A, lecture, skill sharing, any of those different things. Also, the novelty of different people and seeing role models in their area of interest is invaluable. So again, don't be afraid to ask, bring in other people. You don't have to be the expert in everything. And then last but not least, sometimes the realm of possibility is overwhelming for kids and they need some potential ideas or projects. So I've made the error of telling groups that they can do anything and that I'm just there to support them. And when I do that, often few or no projects actually end up getting completed because it's so hard to nail down what to do. I've had a lot better luck offering four or five options that give kids an option to connect with what they do best, what they enjoy, and what they can reasonably do with the time and resources available. So sometimes those ideas then become springboards for new and original projects. But offering ideas, so long as there's the ability for choice and creativity, is usually a good idea. All right, so a lot of the work I've been doing lately has been um, involved um, in supporting local youth in environmental initiatives. So I wanted to take some time to focus on some of these projects and some of these lessons learned. 
So some of this will, the, the stuff that we've talked about previously, you're gonna see in, in these stories. So why did these kids look so happy? They were just part of a youth-led climate resolution that passed through our local city council. So these were a group of students who had been engaged for months and some even years on a long road to get to this moment. So that picture was, in, was, was taken um, the night that it was actually passed. So that was the, the final night of the passage. So this was a long process and we started with compelling education. Um, that happened through a week long climate camp so knowing the science and then the precedent for this type of, res of resolution was really, really important. So the kids, they brought their own passion. This is a group of kids who self-selected to be part of a summer camp specifically on climate. That's a really important point. They found a group who was as passionate as they were and that really helped keep things moving along. If we had tried this work with a random sampling of students, it likely would not have been as successful. So allowing kids to align with their passions and skills is really important. We know this as adults, um, that when you're doing that thing you really care about or that thing you're really good at, things just feel easier. And youth are no different in that regard. So sometimes when things aren't working, it might mean that your group isn't actually aligned with what they care deeply about. So instead of trying to change your group, consider how, you, how can you shift your work towards what they are passionate about? And then alternatively, how can you work with a different group who really is enthusiastic about this topic? So how did they do it? First, um, you can see at this picture at the top, um, them sitting around the table, we set up a meeting with a local city county councilman who we knew would be receptive. And he agreed to sponsor the resolution, but the kids themselves were the ones to meet with him. So um, we also had students practice their speeches at the same space that they would um, be giving in front of the council. So that picture at the bottom, um, that was, actually the afternoon after they had been in their uh, in the rain <laughs> so um, they that's why they were practicing their speeches was to come to this place so um, what are the skills that they needed to work on so aside from the many discrete skills within speech making like delivery content bal balance of fact versus emotion um, they needed to think through what would it be like to speak in front of so many adults so we really wanted to um, tried to get them to think through that. And so we simulated this by having um, adults play council members in the actual chamber. And then one of our most artistic students actually worked for weeks on creating the portraits of each council member. So the picture on the right shows these portraits that one of the students made. She, she worked for many, many weeks and got all of these portraits made so that they looked they resembled the actual council member who would be sitting there. And it sounds silly, and admittedly it was a little silly, but it was a lot of fun, but it really helped the kids know what they were getting into. So when it came to the varying levels of support, my colleague Jim Poiser of Earth Charter Indiana, he was the one to offer a lot of that support. So he was constantly engaging with parents, figuring out rides, interfacing with the adults to set this up, but always listening to the youth. And he struck a per perfect balance on this one, and the resolution was passed and the resolution is seeking um, a carbon neutral Indianapolis by 2035. Now, if you ask Jim, he'll tell you that there's never a balance struck because this work will never be done. And um, being the adult in this work is really a tiring and thankless job. But as adults supporting youth, we really have to manage our own ideas and our own egos. Uh, people want to credit adults because it's hard to understand for some that youth can be this capable and this savvy, but they are. So that makes our main role to listen to them, to remove obstacles, and to get out of their way. One of my favorite parts of this story is that the kids themselves became the motivation and the mentors for other kids who are doing this work in their own cities. So here's a picture of our kids role-playing council members from a surrounding community and then giving constructive feedback to their peers who are practicing their speeches. And just a month or so after this photo was taken, they passed their resolution through their own local council as well. So here's another group of students. Um, and this is a group of students from another local school in Indianapolis Public Schools. And that's with the superintendent of public schools, um, Dr. Lewis Faraby. So these, these kids were worried about um, the fact that their school district was using polystyrene trays. 
to the tune of 4.6 million trays annually. And that's just in one school district. So they started this work with a STEM project at their school. That was their meaningful education and immediately applied this learning and concern to their own cafeteria. They worked with supportive adults who were able to connect with connect them with those stakeholders. So they were able to be connected with the purchasing department and the school board. So they came up with an alternative, proposed it, spoke at the school board meeting, and the school board actually voted to change all of the trays to recyclable cardboard trays. These trays continue to be used in all schools to this day in the district. And interestingly, the new trays actually cost more, but who could say no to these concerned and sincere citizens? So there's a lot of success stories um, when we get out of the way and we let kids do what they can do. Now this project is very near and dear to my heart. So we asked climate um, campers at the end of camp to conceptualize a project that they would like to do in their own school or community. And one of our campers decided to tackle cafeteria waste. And I worked with her because this was my daughter's elementary and also where I happened to have attended elementary school. So my main role for the project was to provide a picture of what this could look like. And we relied heavily on Cafeteria Culture's Cafeteria Rangers program. If, if you um, search Cafeteria Culture or Cafeteria Rangers, lots of resources come up. They have amazing videos and resources that are free to use and download. And we use those to help convince everybody involved that a youth-led waste reduction project could work. So we started with the principal. And um, if you see, um, the young lady with the suit, she's wearing a suit and bow tie, and she has red hair, um, that's Ella. And what she was the, the main youth responsible for bringing this entire initiative to her school. And I asked for the meeting, but she did all the talking. So I was there to fill in details and to provide ideas, but she really ran the meeting. We got a thumbs up and some really important clearance, which was to work directly with the janitorial staff. We got a meeting with the head of that staff and showed him a short video. And Ella asked him if uh, he thought we could do that in their own cafeteria. He was totally on board. So she sold him on why it was so important and through the short video illustrated how it could be done. So we got to work collecting supplies. We as the adults got a small grant to purchase them and we let the kids get to work. So um, a group of 40 kids turned into a group of about 100 kids. So now this is an entirely youth-led endeavor that they have, have trained now 100 of their peers to help the rest of their peers sort out liquids, recyclables, food rescue, trash, et cetera. Um, my main role was to do the trainings for the staff and I really needed to give the adults more attention because they were the ones who were having to support this fairly massive procedure change. Um, we rolled it out and truth be told, there were a lot of kinks. My job was to message to the adults that we had a lot of things to work out, but that we were learning as we were going and that it would be okay. Um, and the program is fully operational now and it has cut um, the waste almost by half at that school. In addition to that, they're doing a food rescue program um, that's delivering food that's unopened and still in packages or fruit that's not been opened um, to four different um, shelters and um, facilities around town that, that need it. So it's that's another um, great example of just a little bit of support. Kids can really lead the way. And then in this picture, she's training kids from another school district who want to learn how to do this. So our top five tips and, um, and then we're going to be done. <laughs> so the first thing is really to redefine your role. So due to years of conditioning, your educator brain might tell you that this is the time, um, that this is not the time to let the kids take the reins and that they need your wisdom. Resist that urge to take control. So if our goal is to nurture the compassionate and creative aspects of youth, they just need to feel that freedom and exhilaration of designing and ex executing a project start to finish. So I recommend assuming the role of a facilitator. As a facilitator, you're still providing them some structure, you're available to give them feedback and support, but the ideas are generated and sustained by the students themselves. So get comfortable with watching ideas take off and fail as well. These failures can be a tremendous teacher and they're gonna serve them long after their youth. So when kids aren't following through or particularly motivated, sometimes that means they're not really feeling enough ownership. So sometimes when I've inadvertently imposed my own ideas, I've seen this happen. They're just not as excited. Um, so when kids withdraw, invite them to adjust the project so that it can become meaningful and inspiring to them. You're gonna see much better 
participation and follow through. And then those healthy boundaries again, um, I just can't emphasize this enough that, you know, those, the healthy relationships and expectations, that's a balance, but um, they can do it. So I think that it's really important, those, those uh, resources that we mentioned before, think hard about those boundaries that are appropriate. Are you going to allow side conversations? Are you not going to allow side conversations? Are electronic devices okay in your time together? Are they not? So think through that with the group, hear them out, and um, then insist on those boundaries. So again, that's in our Justice for All guide that's in, in the link, and I definitely recommend using that. Um, communicate with the other adults. So depending on your situation, this could be the other parents, the educators, or the volunteers involved. One of the hardest parts of this process for me has been to find the right language and approach to effectively communicate with adults about what's happening with the youth. Sometimes youth projects seem loud, messy, confusing, or time consuming. None of these characteristics necessarily mean that they're wasting their time or need an adult to tell them what to do, but it could appear that way from the outside. So explaining this it, um, is a youth-led project is sometimes enough, but often it's important to lay out a few key points to help others understand um, why you aren't orchestrating their every move. So investing you know, a few moments to share with stakeholders what's happening in advance can save you a headache of running interference from critique or judgment. So a couple of my favorite points when I need to make this, how do you get better at running? Practice. How do you get better at drawing? Practice. How do you get better at leadership? Practice. So we really have to give youth the time and space to truly experience leadership. And sometimes that means we're kind of letting them struggle. That's okay. Um, another thing that uh, I often find myself saying is, you won't believe what these kids are up to. It was their idea to create a zero waste cafeteria project, and I'm trying my best to allow this to be a youth-led project. This means that they not only generate the ideas, but they have to figure out how to make them happen. It's tempting to micromanage, but they always figure it out. So even messaging that, letting adults in on what's going on behind the scenes can help calm people down. Um, next is letting go of your vision. So you have a number of years of experience, if you're like me, and sometimes that equates to wisdom, and other times it equates to something else. For me, I might be trying to relive a project that was really successful in my youth that really wouldn't work right now. So fresh perspectives and sincere passion for animals, our earth, and other humans, those are potent forces. But just because their approach doesn't look like the one that you would devise doesn't mean that it's going to have any less impact. So let your wisdom rest for a minute and provide help in the form of acts like formatting flyers, creating permission slips, providing supplies, et cetera, um, and obviously advocating for the youth. The projects that they create always have sincerity and appeal that's unmistakable. And then last but not least, provide inspiration by learning about other youth change makers. Time after time, I have seen a spark that ignites after youth see role models of a similar age do meaningful work. So do whatever you can to try to um, illustrate amazing stories of kids who have done some of this work. And we've got lots of good stories like that um, through, peppered throughout our resources. So what I wanted to leave you with as, as the last um, tool is something that um, hopefully you can look at these questions um, and use them to evaluate some of your own practice. So asking yourself, so what skills are missing? If I've got a group that's not executing, what skills are missing? Are they not understanding how to listen to one another? Are they not comfortable um, generating ideas? What are those specific skills? Then what resources do we need? So think back to that list of resources. What are some resources that might be lacking that could actually help change and, and um, allow them to actually make some impact? Next, are those relationships intact? And it's never too late to try to, to put some work into those relationships. Do we need more ins inspiration or models? Is my own ego as the adult in check? Am I really listening to them? Because sometimes I found myself thinking I've listened to them and I really wasn't. Um, then is the, the background knowledge in place? And do we need to have a frank conversation about what we're trying to do? And last, is there a tangible goal that we're working for? So these, this I, I put in as a way for us to think about um, reflecting on our own practices. 
And I wanted to just show you guys the link to our library. We're so proud of all these resources that we've created um, to help you get that compelling education uh, going in your space. And hopefully when that's in place and all of the hard work that you put into all these other factors, your projects will really start taking off and kids will be able to see the impact of their actions. So our this is my email here. I love working with people. Um, if I have ideas that are useful, I love giving them. Um, and our resources, again, are at teachheart.org. So if there's any questions, I am happy to hang out and answer questions. I see, um, yep, I see that the tribe's question has been answered. If there's anything else at all, um, please feel free to ask, or you're also welcome to email me at Christina at teachhumane, I'm sorry, teachheart.org. <laughs> Thanks, Lisa, for that really nice comment. And absolutely, please reach out. If, if there's anything I have to share, um, I'm more than happy to, to do it. Um, and again, um, as, as the webinar is about to end, um, I really ask that you just take a couple minutes. They're really simple, quick questions, and they really help us a lot. So thank you, everybody. And I look forward to uh, running into you sometime again. Thanks so much.